one and a half billion. That's the number of people who are now coming together in one place to learn, work and share their lives. It's a place we're all still building, minute by minute. The inventor of this giant virtual playground was an English software engineer, Tim Berners-Lee, who, lucky for us, in the 1980s, was suffering from a serious case of information overload at work. Based at CERN, the European Organization for Nuclear Research in Geneva, Berners-Lee was trying to coordinate a mass of different data formats, research papers, and incompatible computer systems from contributors all over the globe. Berners-Lee daydreamed of a different way of organizing information, more useful, more intuitive, more human. Could he use his computer at CERN to create a space where any piece of information would be linked to any other piece of information in the outside world. He realized that to do this, he'd also have to link two ideas that had been knocking about quite separately for some time. The first was hypertext, which was a way of linking documents together using one word to immediately take you to another useful document. These hypertext documents were already commonly used on individual databases and CD-ROMs. The second idea was the Internet, an internationally agreed method of allowing one computer system to send files, messages or data as packets of coded information to another connected computer. Berners-Lee needed to mash these ideas together to create a network of global hypertext, allowing linked data or documents to be accessible to anyone connected to the Internet. He called it the World Wide Web. Never mind the world, if anybody was going to get linked up at all, Berners-Lee knew that the system would need rules to make sure everyone was speaking the same language. And so, he wrote them. Every single piece of information would have an address, like a postcode, where the computer could find and retrieve it. The computers would talk to each other through a set of recognisable protocols, and a common language would mean that any document could be converted into an understandable format for any other computer. And that was it. No central mainframe, no giant bureaucracy, no corporate HQ. No one was going to control the web. It wasn't a physical thing to be owned. It was a space for everyone. And nothing, therefore, would be off limits. Those three rules that Berners-Lee had devised were in fact only there to ensure everyone's contribution from the grassroots up could exist and be linked to on an equal basis. And passionately believing those contributions mustn't be at the mercy of financial barriers or hierarchies, Berners-Lee gave his idea over to everyone to use. For free! And after a cautious start, from the mid-90s, we all slowly went onto Berners-Lee's web and started making connections, and more connections, and even more connections. And each web page, like a neuron in the human brain, could free associate with other pages, revealing surprising relationships we couldn't predict, creating ideas that were insightful, empowering, and strangely entertaining. The weather in Mexico City. The future in the Arctic. The will of the crowd. The one-off blog. Every photo under the sun. News on demand. Shopping. Creating. Confessing. Dating. And from space, we can look down on it all and find ourselves. The world got smaller, but also, surely, more awe-inspiring than we ever knew before. Tim Berners-Lee is still out there right now. He's still passionate about his vision of ever more linked data, of a semantic web that will not only connect information, but interpret it for us, and of a uniquely neutral space that must remain open to every single person. And the power of his daydream from the 1980s? Tim Berners-Lee has put the world at our fingertips, and we're hardly off the starting blocks. We're alive during a genuine revolution. Who knows what's next for the web? Well. We do, because its future is ours to keep creating. So, what are you waiting for? <laughs>